Oh, y'all thought I was going all spring without talking about your idiot league mates, didn't you? Never, never, never. Today, we're talking about seven players to let your idiot fantasy league mates draft in 2023 fantasy football drafts. These dudes are just strikingly obvious fades for me in in this year of our Lord, and y'all better see the same, y'all better do the same, and y'all better tuck your shirts in. If you enjoy the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up button, flex your traps. <laughs> First up on this list, listen, I'm not trying I'm not sitting out here trying to tell you about the most obvious players to fade. Everyone knows to fade the players that are already being faded. So we're gonna we're gonna hit on some early round players right off the rip. First name, and I mean this in no disrespectful manner, but Devontae Adams. Right now, he is a first round pick. He is going eleventh, twelfth overall in underdog drafts. And I I can't get behind that because Jimmy G is going to be exposed this year. The downgrade from Derek Carr to Jimmy G might not seem like much, but it matters where fantasy points matter, and that is particularly downfield. Okay, I think Jimmy G is going to get exposed now that he's not in San Fran working with elite weapons. Okay, if you look at Jimmy G's numbers while in San Francisco last year, shockingly, he led the league in receiver yards after the catch per target. Shockingly, guess who led the league in 2021? Also, Jimmy G in 2020, top five in 2019, led the league. It's actually insane how optimal that offense was for a guy who's not that good of a thrower. Where the problem comes into play for where I see Adams's upside being capped last year, Second most deep targets in the NFL with 38 of them. He led the NFL with nine touchdowns on deep targets, okay? Nine of his overall 14 touchdowns came on deep targets. Derek Carr attempted deep throws on 14.1% of his throws, which was top 10 in the NFL. Last year, Jimmy G attempted deep passes on 9.1% of his throws, 32nd in the NFL. That is 5% fewer over the course of a season, over the course of 500 to 600 pass attempts. That is, it, it matters. It matters. I just see this offense possibly turning into an absolute dumpster fire. And I'm talking about this and making this completely assuming that Jimmy G is a starter. I know he failed his, uh, his physical and there's a chance they get out of his contract. I do think that's probably being dramatic and overblown. I don't think they're trying to put a rookie or a, a non-experienced player whatsoever under center there in Las Vegas. So I'm talking about this under the assumption that Jimmy G is a quarterback. And if he's not, then that becomes even more problematic. Don't get me wrong. I think Adams will still have his 13 for fucking 170 and two touchdown games. But when you are operating in an absolutely dumpster fire of an offense, some of those Knights floor games that he used to have of like seven for 80 turn into like four for 40 with a lot of frustration on the back end real fucking quick. Everyone's like, oh, garbage time, garbage time. Here's the problem with garbage time. It means that you haven't, you're, you're losing and you haven't scored points up to that point. And it also means that if the other team is scoring a lot of points, they're also soaking up a lot of clock. If they're on the field for so long, it's probably because you're turning the ball over or not moving down the field. So garbage time, you can make the argument. It's not something that I necessarily believe in, especially for a player that you want to be your first round. Your argument for a first round pick is garbage time. I don't think his talent has gone anywhere, but the like we talked all offseason about how moving from Aaron Rodgers to Derek Carr would be a problem. No, the real problem is moving from Derek Carr to Jimmy G. He's not worth the first round pick this year. I was fine with him last year. This year, not the same. Moving on to the second player on this list that you should let your idiot league mates draft. Why are you calling me? What are you doing? And he's a two-time offender on this list, and it's Najee Harris. I told y'all not to draft him last year. Hello? Did I just accidentally answer that call? No, I didn't. Okay, we're good. Told y'all not to draft him last year. I got absolutely shit on. One of my most popular videos were like six trash early round picks. Najee Harris was the first guy. He was in the thumbnail, and I got absolutely killed for it. All right, Najee Harris going a lot later than he was last year in drafts. 29th overall. I want to make the case for all the arguments I've heard about why he's going to be good this year, and I will, I will try my best to expose why those are wrong. Let's just straight up, Najee Harris has not been a good running back. He's been fine for fantasy up to this point because he gets a lot of touches and he scored 10 touchdowns in both of his first two seasons, but he has not been a good running back. 
And I think now that Jalen Warren is here, who we'll go into in a little bit later in this segment, uh, that becomes a little bit problematic for him, in my opinion. And I know everybody wants to be like, oh, Najee Harris, it was the foot injury. If he didn't have the foot injury, he was so good. Look what he did at the second half of last year. I'm here to tell you, the fact of the matter is this. This beautifully made chart with a beautiful drop shadow in the background and just crispy looking shit right here that I made from these fingertips. I'm here to tell you that Najee Harris was exactly the same player during his rookie year as he was during his foot injury recovery. I don't even know what magical timeline you got. I basically went back to last year and that one breaking point where he started getting like 20 touches a game. That's where I just said, okay, now he's fully healed, but he wasn't fully healed before then. So rookie season, the first eight games of last year, the last nine games of last year. If you look at every metric outside of just the number of carries they gave him, he is exactly the same player, worse in some instances, better in some instances, yards per carry. 3.9 as a rookie, 3.3 first eight games, 4.1 afterwards. Sure, that's a little bit of an increase. Look at the rest of the numbers. Missed tackles forced per attempt, 18.6% as a rookie, 20.4% during the first eight games, 20.1% during the final nine games. Breakaway run rate. The worst rate he had was the last nine games of last year by a decently significant portion. If you're listening to this via the podcast, one, I would please, I beg you to leave us a rating and review. But secondly, you should come onto YouTube because we've got some good charts here. His elusive rating was smack in the middle of his rookie year in the first eight games. I'm just here to say he was the same player. And you guys can all make these points about, yes, he got more volume and I get it. That's what it was. And he scored a few more touchdowns. He is... As a fantasy player, he's not going back to what he was as a rookie. He's not going to be a top five fantasy back because he's simply, he's not creative. He's not good at making guys miss. And he is, whatever the opposite of explosive is, he is that. He is a snail. And I talked about this a lot going into last year. One of the reasons I didn't like him was because we were so excited about him catching passes, right? He led running backs with 74 catches in 2021. And he still somehow only averaged 4.4 yards per touch, which is, it's horrible. It's actually impressive because usually when you have a lot of your touches via the air, your yards per touch number is amongst you know, the best in the league. But the offense that year threw the ball more than anyone else in the NFL. And they added more weapons. They added better weapons. The It was obvious that the passing numbers were going to come down. And then you look at what they got from Jalen Warren last year. Like his efficiency numbers were great. Top 12 in the NFL in true yards per carry. Number 11 in yards per touch. Number 5 in juke rate. Number 16 in breakaway run rate. Number 5 in yards created per touch. Just really good on a per touch basis. And more specifically just adds an element of explosiveness that I think we're going to see in two minute drills and four minute drills that we don't get from Najee Harris. So if you're looking at Najee Harris, you know, at pick 29, I would much rather take Kenneth Walker two rounds later, Aaron Jones, two rounds later, like those guys. So I'm, I'm off on Najee Harris this year. I'm also off on Debo Samuel, who's going nine picks later, 38th overall. So you're talking about the three, four turn. He came back to earth last year. And I think people are like hoping that last year was just a fluke. And what he did two years ago is really who he was. But I think you should be thinking about it the opposite way. Two years ago was an insane upside case that we'll never see again. I mean, the guy had fucking eight rushing touchdowns two years ago. All of their running backs just kept getting hurt. Elijah Mitchell, Jeff Wilson, like they, they, they forced him into that running back role. My biggest problem with Debo for this year in particular is they're going to have C-Mac there for the full year. And if you look at the splits last year of Debo Samuel with and without Christian McCaffrey, you see on the left side, those are the eight games with C-Mac. His PPR numbers dipped by five. His half PPR dipped by four and a half. His receptions went from five to 3.8. His receiving yards dipped from 65 down to 38. His rush attempt numbers went down. Everything went down. And that is because C-Mac does a lot of the same things that Debo Samuel does, but he's the running back version of it. We also had Brandon Ayuk have his breakout last year. 114 targets, 78 catches, 1,015 yards, 8 touchdowns. Ayuk is a baller, man. The other problem is like we don't know who's going to be at quarterback. Likely Brock Purdy, and that would be best case scenario, I think. But does that mean that's great for Debo? I don't know. Maybe it's Sam Darnold. Maybe it's Trey Lance, who I don't trust either of those guys. I just think the uh, to use a, a back end third round pick on him feels way too way too icky for me right now. But the ickiest pick in probably all of fantasy football is James Cook at eighty fifth overall. He is so clearly just he's we're redoing Kenneth Gainwell again, where the team is literally like. We're going to use him in this one fucking single role on third downs, maybe. We're going to keep bringing in bigger backs, but you guys are going to ignore that and pretend that he's going to be a three-down player. That is what we're doing with James Cook. Going back to college, in which he played four years there, the guy is still yet to top 14 carries in a single game, including last year's rookie game. 
Okay, the guy averaged fewer than two targets per game last year. He will never, ever, 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 ever be the goal line back in Buffalo either. They bring in Damian Harris. They bring in Latavius Murray. Maybe they're bringing in Dalvin Cook. Yet to see. Going to the Jets, though. You look at this tweet from Jacob. James Cook has played 46 games in college and 18 in the NFL. Zero games of more than 14 carries. One game of more than 12 carries. 54 games of fewer than 10 carries carries in 10 games where cook had 10 plus carries seven out of the 10 were non-competitive where they won by two scores he is under 200 pounds he is more than likely the third if not fourth option on the goal line for this team if you look at the carries on the goal line last year for buffalo josh allen had 11 devin singletary had seven james cook had a whopping zero okay he's supposed to be this like revolutionary explosive pass catcher we saw borderline none of that last year in an extremely limited role so I get it I get it the great Devin Singletary the Hall of Fame Devin Singletary who kept James Cook off the field is gone cool number five on this list is Javante Williams you want to talk about any sort of injury optimism I know he's not going early and I know people aren't like necessarily high on Javante Williams but he he basically feels like if you take him in, in any sort of single-digit round, at least based on what we know right now, feels like a waste of a pick. This is J.K. Dobbins all over again. It was just so painfully obvious to see that Dobbins was someone that you didn't want to touch in early rounds last year, and people were just getting optimistic about injuries because that's what they do. The negative energy was everywhere. The negative vibes out of Dobbins were everywhere that this was going to be a long return and that he was not going to be ready for the beginning of the year. This is the same thing with Javante Williams. You guys are going to believe all the coach speak right now, but we have the numbers, we have the science, we have the doctor shit that tells us no. Playing week one would make him an outlier only 11 months out. Dobbins is a better athlete and took 13 for a similar injury. If active, expect limited touches and 75% explosiveness. That projects to rise to 90% by week 8 to 12. It's just it's just like it, it's too much projection. Everything needs to go right in order for him to like be a decent sixth round pick. Like you're hoping that he doesn't land on the pup list. You're hoping that he's 90% by like week 10. I'm just I'm just out there. They signed Samaji P. Ryan, who's going to play a big, big, big role for like the first two months of the season. And there's the other part of this where like Denver's offense might just stink. They might just stink. They were terrible last year. Their wide receivers who were supposed to be good, I got news for you. They're just not good, okay? And Russell Wilson might be cooked probably cook you want to let him cook how about we just cook him he cooked himself Sean Payton is he going to be the savior yeah yeah so that's number five number six uh this one's fairly obvious but there will be people who are trying to get cute OBJ is also another two-time offender of this list I mean you you got to be an idiot to draft OBJ after the multiple like the ankle breaks the multiple ACL tears like your brain has to be t- torn at this point in order for you to, to draft this guy it's so funny I was going back to reading reports on OBJ last year and the reason he was on my list last year was because he tore the ACL again which now furthers the injury timeline like most you know ACL tears you hear nine to 12 month return because he did it twice that return moves from nine to 12 months up to 12 to 15 months and he did it in the Super Bowl Okay, so there was no chance he was playing last year, despite the reports of him being ready for training camp, ready for week one. He'll be ready by November. The reports were hilarious to fucking read through about where he was supposed to come back. It it went from mid-November to late November. He's waiting till after Thanksgiving because he's so thankful uh, to mid-December to after Christmas, late December for a playoff push. It was the Chiefs. It was the Niners. It was the Packers. It was the Giants. It was the Browns. It was the Cowboys. They were all in on him. They all couldn't wait to sign him. And then those reports turned into overwhelmingly doubtful that he returns for the year but we fucking knew that in july we knew that as soon as he tore his fucking acl some people are just so stupid so if you're gonna draft people in the baltimore passing game wide receiver specifically limit it only to bateman and zay flowers please i don't care that he's the least expensive he is the least expensive because he is worthless and then the last player on this list i didn't actually know where to go here i have two players that i'm kind of like tossing through i'll tell you the one guy i was gonna i was gonna put here i was gonna put jerry judy here because I just don't think he's very good. And I also think where he's going in drafts is kind of crazy, where he's like a fourth-round pick now, like at the 4-5, where I feel like you can get much better running backs and also much better wide receivers there. But I think I ultimately landed on Darren Waller as the last player that I'm going to let your idiot league mates draft. All Everything going to be said about Darren Waller for this upcoming year is about how good he was like four years ago. 
anytime we have to rechase people's primes from years ago, coming off of major injuries and team switches and all that shit, I'm just out. I'm just out. We haven't seen Darren Waller put together a complete season and do it efficiently in years, okay? And moving over to New York, I know he's going to be like the top target. The top target in what? A passing offense that throws 14 touchdowns a year? Daniel Jones is passing touchdowns the last three seasons. 15, 10, and 11, okay? And uh, he's missed some time. He played 16 last year, 11 in 2021, 14 the year before that. But, like, this is what you're getting in New York. You're not getting, you know, that best-case scenario of 30 touchdowns from Derek Carr. People are going to make the case all offseason, you know, he's – He's the most athletic guy. He's the best target in this offense. When it comes to Darren Waller, just say no. 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 Do you hear me? Fool's gold. Don't let these fake numbers fake you out. Let your idiot league mates draft these seven guys. That is the first rendition of this video. We'll probably do an update each month throughout the summer. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up button, and turn notifications on because we'll be doing uh, tons of streams of drafts, mock drafts throughout the weeks uh, upcoming, and you won't know that we're drafting, and you could be in the drafts if you have your notifications turned on and you get in there nice and early. All right, I love you. I'll see y'all tomorrow. So subscribe.